Thank you, choir. Young child in the front row responded, Yay. <laughs> Excellent. Alleluia, amen. As we come before God, let us hear together our second scripture lesson. This is Colossians 1, verses 15 through 28. It is found on page 956 of your pew Bible, if you would like to read along with this. The supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And on earth, for in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh, for I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, for the sake of the body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and the generations, but has now been revealed to the saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle, and with all the energy that he has powerfully inspires within me. This is the word of our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come before your scripture, we ask that you would open up your word to us, that we may encounter you, that you may move in us and form us, that we may experience your presence and wrestle with your truth. Lord, we offer this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. This summer, some of you may have had the opportunity to go on some vacations, to get away from regular life. I've had the opportunity to take some trips. One of the trips that my family and I often get to do is to go to a family camp. We are, um, we, my wife and I met at Calvin Crest, a Presbyterian camp in California where we were working on staff. And we have many friends that we go back and see and come and participate. And we got the chance to go to leave our normal lives, to leave all of the work and the tasks and the house and our dog, and go and participate in this. And in the midst of this life, we got to sit with speakers who would teach from the Word of God every day. This was, uh, this was 50s night. He wasn't dressed this way all week. We had friends who were leading us in worship, with the, all of our families and with the kids. We had opportunities to play. We were, we were in the high ropes course. We had all family games. We had times for fellowship to catch up with one another, to spend time enjoying and celebrating together. And in the midst of this week, at the end of this week, we felt like we were centered on Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And then, I came back home, and I found that coming home had distractions. 
There were chores to do. There were bills to pay. There were people talking to me on Facebook or saying outrageous things. There was Twitter. There was Gmail. There were things demanding my attention. And life was different than it was when I was at family camp where someone made all the meals for us and we didn't do any laundry because that happened after we got back home. And I was immersed again in an attention economy. There is a multi-billion dollar industry now that doesn't ask any money from us. All at once is our attention. Silicon Valley has, has amassed these massive companies that live off of one metric. That metric is gaining more of our attention. And it is difficult to combat that. They have the most brilliant minds in our country working to keep us attending longer and longer to them. And so there is so much calling for our attention. For me, I have my chores, I have my phone. Now, you might have heard or recall from another sermon that I gave that I am something of a cyborg. I intentionally incorporate technology in my life. I wear an Apple Watch, I carry my iPhone, I have earpieces for me to hear. And so it is a difficult thing when the devices that keep us connected seek to pull my attention in different directions. And on top of that, I don't know what your passions are. For some of you, it might be some sport. Maybe you're into summer baseball. I love politics. <laughs> and Iowa is a great place for politics. There's no doubt about it. It is a, a wonderful, it's like watching spring training for somebody <laughs> going through the primary. I, I, I love watch, walking through the primary. But politics, there's always something happening in politics. And this week, there was stuff that, that demanded a response. I had friends who were connected to me um, via, via Twitter and other worlds. I have fellow pastors of other races who were asking of other pastors, how will you respond to the rhetoric that happened this week, to the tweets from our president, to a rally where people were chanting, send them back or send her back. And this is a difficult task for a pastor because when we encounter this, there are people who see this so differently. There are people who almost experience it as if they're in two different worlds. And it is difficult to speak truth into that. But at the same time, we are compelled as the Church of Jesus Christ, and particularly in the Presbyterian Church, where we affirm the Barman Declaration. This is the declaration written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his confessing church in Germany over and against the Nazi party. This is part of what we embrace in the Presbyterian Church. And it is a commitment to always be ready to call our nation and our government to something better, to be a prophetic voice. And that is a place that I have had to hold this week as I've responded to those as a pastor. I have had to say the rhetoric that we see falls short of the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. It does not conform with the values of our church. And we as a church need to stand against that kind of rhetoric and call our leaders to something better. Now back to my sermon. <laughs> There's so much calling for our attention. There is so much asking for us throughout our day. From the moment we wake up until we go to bed at night, how do we attend to Christ and his kingdom? There are four passages today in our lectionary. We, um, it is our practice in, in our congregation and in many congregations to follow the revised common lectionary. And we describe this occasionally. From time to time, we'll explain it. The pastors often, it is our practice, to, to select two of the passages from the lectionary. There are actually four, and there are four every day, but in particular, there are four on Sundays, and we choose two. I have chosen two to read in this service, but actually all four of them work together today. They have a common theme 
of attending to God. Amos, our psalm that we read, Luke 10, which is the story of Mary and Martha, and Colossians 1. And I'm going to preach on all four of them, so we'll be here forever. <laughs> but there will be nice pictures. The, the writer Amos captured the prophecy of Amos. And Amos was a prophet in a time when the government, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, the northern and southern kingdoms that had been divided of the people of God, were at this enormous, enormously prosperous time. Their GDP was going through the roof. They were wealthy. And in the midst of this military and economic wealth, they were not following God and God's teachings. And Amos saw this, and he was called by God to rebuke them. In the midst of their wealth, they were doing things to the poor. Rather than out of abundance helping those who had the least, they were ignoring the things that God had asked of them. You have likely heard before from this pulpit or through Scripture that God called the people of Israel to leave the gleanings in the fields. The purpose of this was so the very poorest among them could go and find the last sh the scraps of wheat and grain in the fields so they could survive. But Amos condemned these in the midst of their wealth and their fixation on that. They weren't content with this massive economy. They were persecuting the poor. They were selling the sweepings, he claimed of them. And not only were they doing that to the poor, they were cheating them. They were using unfair measures, he said. You're, you're adjusting your shekels and your, and your weights so that you can cheat the poor, and you're taking advantage of the most needy among you. You have forgotten what God asked of you to be. He said, you buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They had forgotten who God had asked them to be. In addition, they had developed a pagan piety. And this is what I mean by that. They were both following the idols of others of the nations around them, but worse or more significantly, they were treating the relationship with the God who created this kingdom like the idol worshipers were. They were acting as though their task was to give the sacrifices at the idols or at the, the, um, at the, the temple worship and then go about their day living however they wanted to. It was a life of faith where they would, they would treat, they would fulfill their obligation, and then it had no effect on the rest of their life. And out of this came this poor treatment of the poor. It came corruption, um, perversion of justice. They were turning away from God, the one who had created them, the one who had brought them into this promised land, the one who had helped them to come to this place of being a great people. In Psalm 52, we, we see this rebuke. David, this is a psalm of David, and it's accounted that he is speaking to an adversary, and he is describing who this adversary is. And this adversary is a strong man. He is someone who, who revels in being feared, who appreciates using untruths. It is, it is like a dictator. It is, is he's, he's speaking against one who has put his strength and his hope in his own power and his ability to destroy others. And he confronts him, you have not taken refuge in God. Rather, you have taken refuge in your own strength and you revel in evil. And God will uproot you and in contrast, the psalm describes David as an olive tree that's living in the house of God, who finds its sustenance in God, who takes refuge in God. And he says, I will praise your name forever, and I will trust in you. So in the first text, we have Amos calling Israel back 
to something God had desired for them. In this second text, we see an extension of the evil and the brokenness that the, the, those in power in the two kingdoms and their corruption was leading to this, this evil man. And the contrast of David who loved God and sought after God. And the third text is Mary and Martha. This is in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 10. Last week, I was not here, but I know it was scheduled for Jan to preach on the Good Samaritan, and I'm assuming that happened. Yes? So this is the story that immediately follows that. Luke captures the story of Martha inviting, opening her home for Jesus. That seems like an awfully nice thing to do. Martha opens her home for Jesus. He comes in, and Jesus is teaching there. And Luke records that Martha was distracted by the domestic work. She was busying herself with the task of providing a meal, probably. And she came and she complained to Jesus about her sister Mary, who was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to the teachings as Jesus was bringing the word about the kingdom of God. And she said to Jesus, why won't you make my sister help me? Do you see that she's letting me do all this work? And this is a very complicated, challenging word back to her. Jesus says, you are anxious about many things, but only one thing was necessary, and Mary has chosen it, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Now, as scholars look at this, we, um, we might be enticed to think that this means that we don't have to do any more housework. <laughs> I don't think that's it. It's, it's also, you know, this question of, is it, should it be, should we attend to piety? Should we listen to God and, and care about the Word of God and ignore the practical tasks in front of us? And that's not the answer either. In part, we, we know that because it's held side by side with the story of the Good Samaritan, which is this acting out of our faith. So we know it's not that we should not be acting out. Rather, it is like this warning that even when we are doing tasks for the kingdom of God, serving Jesus Christ, they can distract us. They can pull us away from what's necessary and important. And Jesus, you know, what was in Martha's mind? I don't know. I know what it might be if I were hosting. I might be thinking about the, the image of my house and how I want people to perceive it. I might be thinking about wanting to bring honor to him in such a way that it might be important. And Jesus seems to be saying to her, you know, those things aren't important. Just, just put together a simple meal and don't be distracted. We're here to do something greater than that. And finally, First Colossians, the actual text and the fourth and longest sermon of today. I'm concerned that none of you laughed at that. We have the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Colossae. This is a, a church that he has supported and founded, and they are struggling, and he is writing to them. And we hear in the midst of this a doxology of Paul. It is this beautiful statement of who he has grown to understand Jesus to be. This is near the end of his ministry, as scholars understand. They expect that he wrote this around AD 60 or 60 BCE, or CE, 60 CE. And he, he was converted around 35 CE. So this is 25 years after his conversion, after he has founded many churches. He has been on three missionary tours. He has grown and written these incredible things about what it means to understand who Jesus Christ is. And he pours out this confession of faith about who Jesus is and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. First, he confesses to this church, Jesus is the very image of the invisible God, the one who God was pleased to indwell with the fullness of himself. 
He describes that all things were created through him and for him, that all things are held together in him. And he wasn't just describing the trees and the plants and the stones and whatever it is we happen to make. He was describing all the thrones, the dominions, the powers, the seats of Congress and all of our political abilities. He was saying that Christ is the one through whom all of creation was made, the one for whom all of creation was made, and the one who holds all this together. For Paul, as he heard Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God, as he wrestled with Jesus' death and resurrection, he came to understand that everything was held together by Jesus Christ. That when he focused on Jesus Christ and put Christ in the center and understood everything through its relationship to Jesus Christ, that he saw the kingdom of God. He said to this group who were not Jews initially, they were, they were people outside of the Jewish faith, he said, they have sent to us this mystery that has been revealed finally in our generation, the mystery that Christ is in you, the hope of glory, that this God who came and was resurrected lives in you. And for Paul, all of his life was attending to Christ and his kingdom. But how do we do this? You know, there are those who are called to live in a monastery. I am not called to live in a monastery. I don't know of any among us who are in such an order. We are called to live in the rest of our world. And so we are here today in this sanctuary that calls us into this attention on God. But how, once we leave this place, do we keep Christ in the center of our lives? You know, I found that for me, I needed to move away from the distractions of the digital world. Now, this, this literally shocked my staff when they came into a meeting and I pulled out a paper planner. They're like, what? Bill has paper? This is part of what I needed to do as I came back into this world. I needed to, to find the things that were pulling me away, that were distracting me, and, and move to something else. So, so I, you know, I've gone back and forth from, from digital calendars and planners and paper planners throughout my life. But right now, I am going to paper to help me focus, to help me think about what the habits are in my life, to help me see what, what it is that God would want from me. And whatever it is, what are the, the habits that we do? What are the habits that help us attend to our Lord Jesus Christ, to the God who is the center of the universe, the one through whom all things are reconciled, where justice happens? What do we need in our daily lives? That's a question for each of us to consider. What is good for us? What helps us to keep our attention on the kingdom of God. So, for Amos, he called the people of Judah and Israel to come back to the God who created them. For in the psalm, we saw the, the strong man and the one who was rooted in the kingdom of God. In Mary and Martha, we saw one who was distracted by the tasks around and one who was attending to Jesus Christ. And in Paul's confession, we hear his love for and the centrality of Jesus Christ. As we hear these examples, let us bring to the center of our lives the God of our universe, the one through whom all things were made, the one for whom all things were made, because when we are attending to Christ and his kingdom, we are not distracted by the wealth in such a way that we would abuse the poor. Rather, we are concerned for them, and we are seeking to bring justice and reconcile our world. Amen.